All right. Uh, thank you for coming, everybody. My name is Chip Shepard. Uh, I work for Jacobs and Engineering, and I support the Technology Transfer Office over at the Johnson Space Center. Um, and I know what you're thinking. Great. Another talk about the International Space Station, Refrigerator Freezer Rack, and Artificial Gravity, and Mars Direct. Yet another one. Good God, didn't we just have three of those at the last AIAA meeting? I mean, real. So, sorry about that. I don't know how many times you talked about it it's over the dinner table, but you're going to have to go through it one more time. That's the next one. A little bit about me. Uh, I've worked for various companies over at the Johnson Space Center since 87. I have been part of uh, Space Shuttle and NASA Mir, uh, as well as the uh, Constellation program, built some full-scale lunar habitat mock-ups. Uh, but what I'm here talking about today was from my time in the Space Station program office. Um, I supported Larry Toops in the vehicle office, and one of the projects that he gave me uh, was the development of the refrigerator freezer rack, at which I got pictured in the middle. Of I've also been a long-term member of the Mars Society, uh, nine years, ten years, like that, and I was commander for the MDRS Crew 61. Excellent. What I'm here to tell you, talk to you about, um, uh, you know, supposing that Mars Direct gets adopted uh, by a, a president, by NASA, and uh, it starts getting built. Now it's going to be a multi-year development program. And every year, it'll go through uh, budget struggles. And more likely than not, there's going to be a year where it goes into an outright budget crisis. Uh, if uh, any of those circumstances happen, what I'm here to talk about today is I see that the artificial gravity system, as it's proposed in that Mars Direct system, in that architecture, it's susceptible to getting cut totally out. I have seen it happen before. NASA and ESA, we were building these refrigerator freezer racks for a space station. There was going to be an entire fleet of these things for ISS. We were building them from 99 to 2003. And along the way, in the 2002 time frame, the program office came to a budget crisis, and they cut this. And it has never been restored. And more importantly, they have never been missed. Next one. A couple of things I promised my bosses that I'd say that this is, represents my opinion and not theirs. I also want to point out to you, I'm primarily talking about, I'm, I'm talking about uh, artificial gravity as it applies to being in our very initial missions to Mars. Uh, I think AG has a, has a role to play later on. So the talk today is about uh, how it's susceptible to being eliminated from those initial missions. So, go ahead next. First, I'm going to talk to you about the ISS RFR, which probably not a whole lot of you had exposure to. Um, also, the how and why that it got canceled. A little bit about the Mars Direct AD. That's probably all very familiar with that, so I'm not going to say much. And then give you the similarity of the situations, and then we'll uh, and then we'll wrap. All right, the ISS refrigerator freezer rack. This thing was being built to carry food, not signs, not blood, or, or anything like that. Now, this one was being built just for food. Uh, ESA got the job for this one. Uh, it was part of their contribution to the ISS efforts, and that was uh, part of what was in the barter. Um, their contractor was in Germany. I got uh, six trips to Germany out of that, working with them on it throughout the uh, throughout that project. And I was telling you, there was going to be a fleet of these. Okay? We were going to have 10 of these. Three of them were going to be in the ISS at any one time. At first, it was going to be in the habitation module. And then later on, it got, when that module got cut, it got moved over to, uh, it got uh, no two. So there were going to be three of these at any one time, getting swapped out in their entireties by the crew whenever there was a resupply mission. So they were going to come up in MPLMs. Um, 
So three on board, three in an MPLM coming up, and three in an MPLM that was on the ground getting ready to come up. So it, it was going to be a very active program to, uh, to be delivering refrigerated frozen food to the crew. Um, but in the end, all we got out of it was a single qualification model that works very well. It's a JSC now. It works very well. They did a very good job with that. Um, but no, no flight models were ever delivered. Next picture. And ship is going to be supplied by the space shuttle, carried by the space shuttle. Yes, the MPLMs are going to be in the space shuttle payload bank. Yeah. So you see, one big. So the MPLMs are processing before they get put into the shuttle. So that's why there was always one. Then in production, you'd have to have the racks in there. All right. Well, this is uh, a graphic of it. Uh, give you a good picture of it. But uh, you can see that this is built on a standard Boeing rack. It was a Dash 7, a special configuration just for this. And uh, there were four compartments. Each one could be programmed to be a refrigerator or a freezer. And you could change that at any time you wanted to. There's drawers inside of each one of these, um, all of them controllable separately. And, and thermoelectric is the way that they provide their cooling. So very energy efficient. And a really great design overall. You could launch a lot of cargo. You know, this could this could take the launch loads and the landing loads and and keep everything cool within a really uh, small amount of power. So anyway, they did a great job with it. Next picture. And here's a photo of the final qual model with the Boeing rock and everything. So we got this delivered to us. Uh, really nice job. Next one. And a picture of the drawers inside. How that all worked. Next. All right, so then came ISS change request 6451A, which deleted these RFRs, and not just that, but also all of the ISS refrigerator frozen food research and development that was also going along. And this was all done in 2002, and it was due to the, a big time budget crisis. And they were really scrambling to cut things to the bone. Um, this turned out to be one of the uh, uh, one of those things that was sacrificed and never got its way back. So, you know, and they they just got an immediate release of 2.5 million for that. But of course, in later years, when they realized an overall savings because they didn't have that research program anymore, to develop those foods, and the food program could just figure on developing what well, the existing food system. And the overall savings was uh, about 14 million. Next. So there are reasons why, from, from a program office standpoint, this is the program office people on their board that made the final decision, they're sitting there, and this, is, this represents their thinking a lot, because uh, theirs was the final say. But the ISS was accumulating a lot of experience at the time that the shuttle-based food system was perfectly fine without the RFR. You know, we were accomplishing these missions, no complaints, the crew was eating, fine, no complaints. So uh, they were getting the idea more and more that, I mean, the, the idea was that those are far not really required. Um, second one was the rationale for having those RFRs was kind of um, a physical health enhancement. They were, you know, the, the foods were working fine, but they were, you know, the food people were saying, oh, well, there is too much salt. We'd like to cut back the salt. And crew was saying, we do miss fresh foods. We don't get to have as much fresh food as we would like to have. Um, and the, uh, and psych support was saying, well, you know, meals are so important. If you have really great meals, that will mean so much more to the crew that's on orbit. And a happy crew is a productive crew. Well, all these are nice to have, but when push came to shove, you know, the program office is going, if I don't have those on board, is there any part of the ISS construction that I cannot finish? Is there any mission um, in my list of missions here, is there any of these missions that I will have to take out of the manifest because I don't have an R for them? And all these people would say, well, no. Okay then. Reinforces their viewpoint. It is not required. Absolutely. Required. 
supplier. Uh, all the people that you would think would want it, that, that didn't want it, they liked it. The medical folks and the crew and the food people, all those people, yeah, they liked it, they wanted it, but they weren't ever going to make a stand to say they would absolutely refuse. At some point, they would refuse to support any ISS mission that did not have an RFR on it. They simply weren't going to say it to us. Once again, reinforce the program office standpoint. Okay, then. No. We got absolutely required. Next. Now, from their viewpoint, hey, I got an ISS configuration that works perfectly well. I'm doing successful missions with this. Now, I had an RFR. Now, I got an ISS configuration that I had never had before. To them, that's one big fat unknown. You just added something. And that that is the... Um, if it ain't broke, why would I want to fix it? That, it's that kind of thing. So that scares them. And then you've got it all set up for the killer question. The program office, they asked us, okay, look, if that RFR breaks down on day one, am I going to have to cancel my mission? Am I going to have to make it short and, and bring my crew down? There is no good way to answer that. Well, and they know that. Because if you say yes, well now, all of a sudden, you're saying, put in this RFR, now you've created a new way they didn't have before for cutting the mission short. Well, interruption of mission is bad, very bad. Only, only loss of crew and vehicle is worse. You know, loss of, loss of mission early, uh, having to call everybody down early, that's bad. So they won't accept that. And they will tell you, you need to you need to go out, not just you, they'll, they'll get it to the entire, uh, all the disciplines, come back. We need to come and put a solution in place. All right, well, but yes wasn't the answer. The answer that came back at the time they asked that question was, no, we have a solution in place. And that is that um, uh, we already have a contingency food supply on board in case the launch doesn't get to go up with the replacement crew in time. You know, we already have some extra food on board. Well, we'll just uh, build into that contingency supply to build for this contingency that the RFRs don't work. So we will have enough on board that if the RFRs don't work on day one, we'll still have enough food on board that we can get through the entire increment without we'll enough food. Well, program office people, they hear that sitting at the head of the table, and they go, if I've got enough up there, Enough food up there to get through my entire increment. I don't, and, and without even counting the food in the RFR, then I don't need that RFR. Let's just take that out, and let's just go with this non-RFR food supply because it's doing fine, and we've got enough. You've already said to me, you've already got enough in the plants. We will just go forward with that, and so that's when they had the CR built. They said, let's put out a change request and let's see how everybody else feels about that solution. And well, everybody else went, uh, they licked their chops and went, wow, there's some, what I could do with all those extra racks that uh, Boeing is making, and then I could use those for my payloads, and I won't have to build my own rack so I can save you some money in my payload program. And uh, other folks went, hey, if I don't have to take those RFRs up and down, I got a lot more up-down mass that I can allocate to other people that are trying to get up to space station, but they can't because there's nowhere to put them on our shuttles going up. And the crew time for taking those back and forth and the limited docking time, I can do a lot more stuff during that docking time, move other people's stuff over. And then there's some uh, power allocation that I can allocate to other people that need that power. So there were a lot of people that were going to benefit from the RFRs getting cut. At the ISS program, mostly, they were going to get $2.5 million in savings for that particular year and then some for future years. And they really needed that. And so it was all set up, and so they, they cut it. They said, man, that RFR is not required. It is adding risk. It is using up resources that other people, you know, I got a list of people that could use those resources. And so that's the way they went. They voted it out. Question already? Well, <laughs> but now with people talking about airliners, space liners, they're going to need that, right? Because they're not going to give them little packets. Or they're going to make people feel like astronauts and give them, here, here's some space food. You know, what is it? Oh, it's this, it's eggs and bacon. 
we don't know for sure, but you know, with that there would be a normal airline. I mean, you're paying three hundred thousand dollars for a ticket. Well, it's not exaggerated. It's only two hundred thousand. Oh, okay, okay. Over the top on. Potential benefit to the public was way down the list at that time. Right, right. Oh yeah. So you didn't even enter the picture. Yeah. I just mean that. Next one. Alright. So now Mars Direct, artificial gravity system. That's the words. Let's do the next one. Picture. Yeah, okay. Here's the hab part here. There's a space uh, a spent uh, uh, module over here. Spent the uh, stage, ascent stage over there, and you, you give it the boost, and you go in, you go in circles with a top tether in between. Uh, key thing, and I this is my box, not theirs. Add this box. Mission continues if tether fails. Remember that for later. Not much. Later. Still good. All right, next. Similarities in the situations. Well, here we are. Um, the ISS is accumulating lots and lots of experience. That there's increments of six months or more. These durations that um, equal or exceed the one-way trip to Mars, um, the people are getting through it uh, perfectly uh, fine. They're not dying. They, uh, of course, the crew is impacted, see, but it's it's not really extensive uh, permanently. Um, as a matter of fact, some of the crew. You know, if they're very dedicated to their exercise program, they come back in even better shape than when they uh, went up. Um, all the, uh, the bone demineralization, and they get 90 plus, 90 percent plus back from that. Uh, so it's most it's not permanent. So to them, from the prior office, they're not dying. They're not complaining. They're not unable to do things. They're not coming coming back and being. Uh, uh, invalids or anything, so it's like from, from their standpoint, you know, it's like, all right, we, you know, we're, we seem to be doing fine. Uh, next is the rationale for artificial gravity is, is physical health enhancement, um, trying to prevent the bone demineralization, and productivity increase most for the people who, once you get to Mars and you land and you're more productive, because you've been in the artificial gravity all the way through. Thing is, you know, no one appears to be willing at this time saying that, all right, an AGS system is absolutely required to complete a mission to Mars. It is just got to be in any mission architecture, or you are a non-starter. We cannot even discuss that Mars path unless you got an artificial gravity system in there. I don't think that anybody's saying that. And lastly, there's the, the people who are proponents, really. I mean, they're um, artificial gravity advocates, Mars direct purists, I think. Um, I think that teams, at the time in the program, the, the crew that would be in the program at the time, and uh, the medical folks, the ops folks who are seeing productivity increase on the surface of water, those people, they would probably be unwilling to say that they would be unwilling to support a mission scenario. They would totally just, just, just veto it if artificial gravity wasn't part of the equation. But they'll do that. What's that? Adding artificial gravity to the initial Mars mission suit presents um, an unknown risk. To the program office, all of our mission experience um, on ISS and, and other uh, missions, you know, it's all been working fine. So now, if it ain't broke, why are we going to fix it? Why are we going to stick in this unknown that, that suddenly it could possibly screw things up? We've been doing missions without it, and they've been working fine. We'd be more comfortable working that way. So then, what I project the Mars program office people at the front of the board would ask is if the artificial gravity breaks down on day one, are we going to have to cancel? Are we going to have to come right back? or you know, we're going to have to cut short our mission. If you say yes, mission uh, cutting mission short, loss of mission is really bad, going to be unacceptable. They're going to ask for the 
uh, community to come together to put a solution in place. However, the answer is not yes. We have seen on that chart a couple of charts ago, the answer is no. Mission continues if the tether fails. So, if the mission continues, it's not continuing under artificial gravity. It's continuing under microgravity, which means, what's next? All the systems on our, Mad, our Mars have transport vehicle will have a requirement to be able to function and operate for that entire time period in microgravity as well as partial gravity. Now this is going to make every system on that Mars have trip. It is just going to be way more complex and costly um, and risky than we've ever had anything before. The, uh, I mean, you take a look at the ISS alone. I mean, that thing is really complex and costly as is. And it was designed totally to work in microgravity. Imagine if it had a requirement on it throughout the entire development period that it would also have to be required to be able to work in a partial gravity situation as well. There's portions of it that, that, you know, that just doesn't mix. Thermal systems, the thermal systems on ISS can only work in microgravity. They cannot work in a gravity field. Um, the robotic arms for ISS and shuttle, they can't, they, they can't lift their own weight in a gravity field. They were designed to work only in microgravity. Uh, trying to get your house to, to be designed, uh, to, you know, it works in a gravity field. It had, it had to be designed to also work if, if gravity went away. I mean, I don't think you've been able to afford the place. <laughs> so what we project out of that is that the program office would come to the conclusion that if I've got to make it work in microgravity, then anyway, and if I've got to make it work in partial gravity, that's only going to make it more costly. It's certainly not going to make it less costly. Let's just, since I've got to make it work in microgravity anyway, Let's just see if we can just go in microgravity. Let's see what everyone else says about that. Uh, what do you all think? If we all just take this out and we all we just we just go in a microgravity field, what does that do to your situation? Crew and electrical and thermal and data and navigation. Wait, next. So there's an annual budget struggle that goes on. But certainly, a program hits budget crises from time to time. ISS had theirs. There was one year where ISS was only voted to continue by one vote in Congress. And so that, that came close. I don't think that the people who would support aid, uh, the artificial gravity, the people who should be supporting it, would be very strong in their support. Not enough to defend it to defend it as a requirement against the challenges. And then there would be a lot of other disciplines out there that would lick their chops and go, man, you know, if I don't have to make it work in mindful gravity and artificial gravity, my system becomes way, way more cheaper, way more easier to develop. And they will get lots and lots of those answers. And um, I mean, the, the ultimate answer is going to come back that, all right, it is not required, not absolutely required, it is adding risk. It is adding way more resources than we can afford. And the program office, I think, is going to cut this and then realize a lot of budget savings. And they're going to uh, reallocate uh, those other resources over across the other disciplines. Next one. So in conclusion, look, I, I love the Mars Direct plan. I really do. There's some really great stuff in it. You know, sending stuff ahead of time, uh, refueling the return vehicle before you even send people out there. That is great stuff. And uh, trying to go there as simply and directly as we possibly can, I think that is uh, really great stuff. Um, living off the land or using the resources of Mars, you know, to, to get that fuel instead of sending all the fuel you need ahead of time, using Mars resource. Uh, to reduce your own, uh, what you have to launch yourself tomorrow, I think that is all great stuff. 
I just think that um, I think a lot of the Mars Direct Plan is fundamentally strong, and a whole bunch of it makes is consistent in how it is truly required. Um, it's just, you know, and since it's required, it's defendable. I think that with the artificial gravity, though, uh, it is it is not so. It is not so easily defended as being absolutely required. It is not so defendable. And as such, I think it negatively impacts the credibility of the rest of the Mars Direct plan. It could behoove us to recognize it doesn't have a future. It is susceptible to being cut. We ought to, uh, we should, um, we should take the initiative and we should do it ourselves. Where we can do with it is that we can take that artificial gravity configuration and we can include it as part of a subsequent Mars direct exploration phase. Okay, the, the, the Mars direct phase that's written in the book, that does not have to be the be all, end all of the program. I, this is just the initial missions I'm talking about. We should just cut this for the initial mission, we should move it to later missions. The initial missions don't have to be the final configuration of things. Uh, uh, for example, like I said here, the, the first Apollo landing, we didn't take a rover. We added a rover later. The first shuttle that we launched, it didn't have six crew in it in a space lab. We had two people in that first one. The first one, the first configuration, the first missions don't have to be, you know, final. You grow into those. So why not move artificial gravity configuration to, to something later, after the initial ones, and this should be as simple and as, as cheap and as uncomplex as possible, are accomplished. And that's all I got. <laughs> um, I do have one more thing. Y'all are great, and I we brought, I brought some of these for you. So, uh, are they in the back? Or they're, they're in the, the back corner there. They're in the back corner, so be sure to take on. The lady with the um, yellow is with you before you go. Can I make a comment? And, no, well, now we'll, yeah, we're going to take questions and everything. I just want to make sure I got I told everybody about that. Okay. I think you made an excellent case sure. for why the ISS program office cut the refrigerator, and I think you make an excellent case for why the Mars program office ought to cut artificial gravity. In case you don't know it, our only experience with tethering almost till Neil Armstrong and John Young. They got tethered to a Gina. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. I think I, was, I think I heard about something that got experienced and they used an electrical line. Is this that one? They were tethered to the Agena yeah. when the RCS went out of control <coughs> and they went into a terrible spin and Neil Armstrong barely got them off of it. So that's our own experience. Um, and as you point out, there's a whole lot of risk to having a spinning tether and a lot of complication to build it. And not a whole lot of good comes from it. So I think you need to keep that in mind. And I looked at space stations for NASA. 1968, I think they were the first ones we did, and in that case, our RFP called for them to be artificial gravity, and then two bitters, Boeing and McDonnell Douglas, and NIFU, it looked like 2001, they actually launched and unfolded into a donut, so that they would have spinning and artificial gravity, and after that we decided not to do that again. So there's a lot of history behind this. Good points. Yes. I would, as far as the, the all this stuff that we have to deal with gravity would be designed, would there be a difference between AGS and Martian gravity? I mean, would some, some of the systems have to function under gravity? I mean, with Mars Direct, I thought the shortest duration stay was something like two to three months before you just come back. So a lot of the systems would be able to have to work under Martian gravity. 
Yes, and I think the point I guess I'm trying to make is that yes, there's there's a there's a stage there in the transit going out there right now. It, you know, it's a, you got to be at least it's a mic microgravity environment is there at least as continuously coming back and it's going away. So I think there's the transit, which is like a microgravity hab is environment is what's needed for that. But then on the surface of Mars, that is a that is a Mars gravity environment that is required for that. See? So I think an important key is trying to, you know, you you, you have separate halves, you build your halves yeah. for the environment you're in. And you find a way to do that and not try to have one half that has to be able to go on both. So you say We're not ready for that. So you say like the first let's say they send the first unmanned half, that would be designed to work in Martian gravity. And then the one that the crew goes in will be microgravity normal. For for instance. For instance. Yeah. For instance. And we'll be missing right. Right. Oh, oh, yeah. Actually, we have, we've oh. run out we've run over time a little bit. Dang. Um, I know, I think I saw like seven or eight hands still up. Um, if you guys want to talk to them kind of afterwards. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. I'll stick around yeah. as long as you need. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'll go out, I'll go out there.